Hitting the record button. Got it. All right. Uh, we are with Leela McMinch. She is a Republican candidate for governor uh, running in the May primary. Leela, thank you for joining us. I'm Dave Bundy, editor at the Journal Star. And uh, this is our endorsement interview. We um, have other editorial board members, uh, some of whom may be joining us, all of whom will be watching this video. When we get done in this video, we'll also be available to our readers. So Lilo, I'm just gonna jump right into the questions here, especially because okay. the first question gives us a chance for you to introduce yourself. So um, why do you, why do you want to be governor? Has it looked all that fun to be a politician lately? And then what experiences and attributes qualify you for this office? All right, well, first of all, thank you for this interview and recording it so all Nebraskans can see me, um, as well as all of the other candidates. One of the reasons that I want to be governor, despite all of the chaos and contentious behaviors and actions all across the entire nation is, you know, I feel like that I have walked in the shoes of so many other Nebraskans um, that I would serve them all well. You know, I, I came up from nothing in my life, worked hard, struggled, it was challenging, um, and then just continued to work hard until I, um, stepped up into different positions of leadership throughout the state. And then I saw this opportunity come up to be the governor. And I said, you know what? I believe that I can represent all Nebraskans, every single one of them, regardless of what race they are, gender, what political party they're from, regardless of religion or anything else that I represent and will listen to all of those people. And so that's why I decided, you know what? I believe I am the best person to do that and can unite us again. We're so broken. We are so broken as a country and even as a state, I recognize that um, we need to pull each other back together. We need to start putting our hands out and give people hands up and showing how we're unified and solid together as Nebraskans, regardless of who we are. So that's why I decided to step up and run for governor. Uh, I will introduce myself formally and tell you all about me and my knowledge, skills, experience, and abilities to serve in this position. Um, I am a lifelong Nebraskan. I've lived all 56 years of my life here in Nebraska. My husband and I have five daughters and seven grandchildren making a total of seven generations to live in Nebraska and make this our home. And so we are very deeply rooted here uh, and committed to the state and everything that takes place. Uh, I grew up in York, Nebraska. I was born in the Sand Hills, but moved when I was three to York, Nebraska, where I grew up. Graduated from high school there and York College, where I studied the Gospels and the Minor Prophets. I went from there to the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and received my degree in education and was an elementary school teacher, a substitute teacher for several years and said, you know, I really need a full-time job. And so I went to work in the maximum custody women's prison while I lived at York and worked there for five years in custody before I transferred to the Lincoln Correctional Center and then was promoted to emergency preparedness response specialist and hostage negotiator there for the Department of Corrections. So I worked at LCC, the treatment center when it was at Air Park and the penitentiary, training, guiding people on emergencies, crisis response, and serving as the advisor to the commander in situations where there were um, hostages, riots, escapes. Um, so, you know, I, I guided people and helped with life and death decisions. Well, some would say that uh, being a hostage negotiator is all of the qualification you need. But you know, uh, someone else said that the other day. They said, "Oh, you're going to need that working with all the people you <laughs> work with." But you know, it's about listening to people and really hearing them, 
and hearing the emotion in their voice um, and caring, you know, truly caring about the concerns that people have and doing something to make a difference. From there, I was recruited to the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency, where I was able to work with first responders all across Nebraska and train them on mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery to all hazards that face Nebraska. Uh, I worked with the Leaders Group, which is the Livestock Emergency Disaster Response Systems for contagious animal diseases and how and where to cull the herds and where to bury them in the state in order to um, keep our water safe and clean and pure and not affect the aquifer or any of our drinking water with the burial of those livestock animals. Um, also, I worked with all of the state agencies and worked on continuity of operations and continuity of government. So if a tornado strikes, takes out a building, a facility, an agency, we can still continue to operate in the state and provide the necessary um, services to the people across the state. And having those skills I think is paramount because anything can happen in Nebraska. We can have all four seasons in 24 hours sometimes, we've seen that. So we need to be able to be prepared and know what to do. From there, um, I went to the Nebraska Department of Education and served as the Director of School Safety and Security for the Department of Education. At that time, it was 244 school districts across the state and helped them update their school safety plans, provide training to all of the educators um, periodically to the students on safety and security, bullying, cyberbullying, date violence, mental health, suicide awareness and prevention, and active shooters, how to respond, how to prevent them, how to keep people alive in our schools. So the educators and keep the facilities safe as well. There were some budget cuts. And so uh, I was sent off and I went to Grand Island and served Grand Island and Hall County as their local emergency manager and 911 director um, for the third largest city in Nebraska. And I helped with the H1N1 pandemic, which was going on, that was the bird flu. And we actually developed, a team of us developed a response plan on how to take care of all of the community, um, all of the state actually, in response to that. Uh, it's, it was actually much worse for contagion and death than the COVID right now, it was much worse. So we're very fortunate that we didn't have that. But at the same time, I helped with the activation of the strategic national stockpile and the push pack from the federal government in the anthrax scare, when all the anthrax letters were out there and there were threats going on and we didn't know if there would be um, biological warfare or a dirty bomb somewhere. So I helped to coordinate the storage and protection of that. And we had it on hand if we needed to distribute it across the state to make sure that everybody who wanted it was able to have the medications that they needed to survive um, a dose of anthrax, which was pretty scary. Then the Department of Education called me back and said, hey, would you come back? And I said, absolutely. You know, uh, education is my passion. And it's very important to me to keep our children and our educators alive because our democracy was based on education and religion. So it's so important to have a safe learning environment. So I returned to the Department of Education and worked there for about five more years before there were budget cuts to the state and they eliminated my program. So there was no longer school safety and security for the Department of Education. Um, they've since brought that program back, thank goodness. But I was able to work with Tom Nesbitt and Lloyd Hansen with Nesbitt and Associates. And we created school security services where we continued to provide updated school safety plans and training to public schools, private schools, colleges, and universities all across the state. And then I was fortunate enough to get a call from the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And they said, you know, we've heard your name out there as a subject matter expert in school safety and school violence. Would you teach for us? 
And I said, oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. So right now I get to be an adjunct professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, helping to build our thin blue line um, at the university. And I, I have amazing students. And I will tell you that the future looks bright, regardless of law enforcement being brutalized. I know the students going through my class are absolutely amazing and quality individuals who will help. The certifications I have, uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a trained educator. When I was in corrections, I was able to go to Campbell, California to law enforcement training research associates and received advanced training on emergency preparedness response and brought that back to Nebraska. I'm also certified emergency manager, both at the state and federal level. I've trained in continuity of operations, continuity of government, national incident management systems, incident command systems, and Homeland Security exercise evaluation programs. Uh, I'm a trained certified hostage negotiator for the Department of Corrections. Um, also appointed to, by the governor, to the U.S. Attorney's Anti-Terrorism Advisory Committee and the Nebraska Infrastructure Protection Committee. I've served on the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals for the state and the um, Nebraska Suicide Prevention Coalition. I also had the opportunity to go to Israel and be trained at the University of Israel at Tel Aviv by the Mossad and the Shin Bet for advanced homeland security and brought that back to the state with me as well. Uh, Leon, worked, yes. We're, we're about almost halfway done and Ooh. we're still on question number one. So Holy smokes, wanna, we'll go on. If you wanna finish, uh, if there's a high point or something that you haven't gotten to, we can do that, but we're going to have to pick up the That's pace. That's it. Keep going. All right. So uh, sorry about that. Second question, no. um, and some of these you've already sort of touched on. Governor Ricketts and the legislature have proposed measures uh, related to land use, like prohibiting people from entering uh, permanent conservation easements. Yes. Um, they've, got, uh, they've got issues involving... Uh, education and books, they've got issues involving public health that all sort of decrease local control, which is not a uh, concept that, I mean, Nebraska is usually Bad. about local control. So what's your philosophy on local control and, and those issues sort of broadly? I believe big government is bad. I believe we should have local control. I am against the 3030 land grab, the conservative conservatory issues. Uh, we, we lose all control and use of that land and that water. If the federal government steps in and says, oh, let's make this a tourist place. We don't get to irrigate with it. We don't get to raise our crops on that land and we don't get to graze our cattle. So that's but, a bad thing, local yeah, that's control. A that, that's a that's a federal issue though on on the state level uh, mm -hmm. governor ricketts has proposed going the other direction and not allowing landowners to sign a permanent conservation easement oh. if they want should the state be able to keep a landowner from doing that if they do it voluntarily no not if they do it voluntarily we should have okay. control of the decisions we make okay all right um, this one, I think, uh, question number three, I think you probably have some thoughts on. What are your priorities and plans to address our corrections crisis? Yes. First of all, I do not believe we need a new prison. They're not going to tear down the state penitentiary. So the information that says it's too old and not workable and it's dangerous, they will still use it. There are plenty of empty buildings across the state of Nebraska that we can um, just modify to put our inmates in and put them in correctional facilities based on custody level or crime instead of putting everybody into general population. I think that's a mistake. Also, if you look at Hastings, the regional center was there, then it was used for corrections, and then it was served uh, as an ICE facility for detainees. It is virtually empty. There are a handful of people there right now, but we can use that facility again and in doing that, you reduce um, overcrowding at the prison and you also bring jobs back to a local community so people can live where they work and that's a good thing. We also need to consider um, nonviolent inmates 
is being in prison really serving the best purpose? Or could we monitor them by um, uh, a leg bracelet with GPS monitoring? So they go to work, they provide for their families, but then they serve their sentence at home at night. They don't get to go out and do other things. I think that might be something that we need to look at as well. All right. Um, next question for you. Um, in your mind, uh, what, what is the solution? What is a step toward uh, tax reform? And if, if tax reform includes tax cuts, where does the money come from? Absolutely. Tax reform is very important. I feel the burden of taxes just like everybody else does. I think we need to cut spending by things like not building a new prison, not dedicating millions and millions of dollars to uh, local community centers for our children. Again, there are empty facilities that we can modify and spend so much less by doing it that way, just by spending our money smartly instead of having everything be shiny and new. We don't need to do that. I also believe that we need to put caps on spending limits for the future. I think we should audit every single state agency, identify redundancy in activities, anything that they're doing, and cut those programs out or even those positions out. If you have 10 people doing one job, maybe that's a little overkill on that. So let's audit all of the state agencies and cut out what we don't need. Okay. Um, now we're uh, really picking up the pace. So <laughs> okay. the, the, the next question for you, um, do you believe efforts to investigate the 2020 election in Nebraska are warranted? And do you support efforts to change the state's election law and procedures? If so, how can those changes be made without suppressing or disenfranchising voters? First of all, we can't change the past and anything that happened. We can identify what took place if we need to do that. Um, if, if there was ballot stuffing, we need to look at that and make sure that that never happens again. If the machines that we have in place uh, have the ability to cheat in any way, we need to be able to audit those machines as well and correct that. Um, I think that a hand count would be very important that we do a local hand count, um, write that number down, then let the machine count it. Hopefully we get the same number. Then you send that to the county. They should get the same number as well from all of, all of the votes that are coming in. If they don't, then we're gonna have to slow down and recount again to make sure that the machines aren't messing anything up as they're counting. And then that needs to come to the state and the numbers need to be the same from the local area, the county, and the state. It all needs to match. To reduce cheating, several things that we can do, re-register to vote every time you renew your driver's license or your state ID. That eliminates dead people from voting. At least for you know, a four year span of time, we eliminate that. That means we also show our state ID when we vote. I have to show my ID when I fly or do anything else. We should be required to show our ID when we vote. Also, when people come into the state and receive a driver's license or an ID, they need to show their US, US birth certificate before they can um, get a special mark. And I don't know what that mark will look like on our driver's license that says, yes, I am actually a US citizen and qualified to vote in the sovereign nation's voting system and elections. If you don't have that mark on your ID, you don't get to vote. And that'll show up at the poll booths um, so we can identify and stop the cheating if you're not a US citizen to vote. I also think it would really help if we brought polling booths into nursing homes and senior centers, assisted living centers, so that the vulnerable population in the state um, maybe they have mobility issues that they have the opportunity to go to the polling booths in their golden years as well. And it's protected. We're not counting on somebody 
picking up their ballots and delivering them. So that that just eliminates all those areas of cheating for us. Okay. It, do you? I mean, do you believe that that's that that's been an issue in Nebraska? Or are are I mean, uh, Governor Ricketts think, and and Bob Evden have said. I uh, think we're pretty solid in Nebraska because we have paper ballots. It's much more difficult to cheat. We have paper ballots. We do counting. Uh, uh, we do count them. I would prefer the hand count first and then the machine count. Otherwise, I think we're we're pretty good. I think we're pretty honest. You may have a handful of situations and you always will where somebody's cheating. But if you look at the big picture, I think overall we're pretty solid in Nebraska in our votes. Okay. Uh, question number six, should the legislature scrap nonpartisanship? And if not, how do you make our nonpartisan legislature less partisan than it is right now? I do not believe we should scrap it. I think it's a very important, uh, and I honestly wish that in Nebraska, when we ran for office, that you didn't have to check a box, that you could just say, I'm a Nebraskan, and um, you are elected based on your knowledge, skills, experience, and beliefs, and let everybody see everyone. To make it less partisan, wow. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Um, you know, an idea that I would like to see happen in the government, and, and right now I understand that it's against the law to do it, is to be able to cross party lines when I choose a lieutenant governor. I have to choose a governor, a lieutenant governor from within my party when maybe there's somebody um, who is a libertarian who you'd were aligned very closely and maybe that would be a great representation for the state to say, you know what, not only is the unicameral nonpartisan, but our governorship is willing to reach across the lines to embrace all Nebraskans and serve all Nebraskans because we're not all just Republicans in the state. We're very diverse in everything. I think that might work. Okay. All right, well, we are to our last question, which as I said, uh, was somewhat open-ended. I don't think you'll have okay. a problem with it. What, what have we not asked you that you wish uh, we would have? Hmm. Or any of the things well, that we asked you that you'd like to amplify? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, issues in education, uh, as I stated earlier, education, and religion are the foundation of our democracy. We need to focus on educating our children on core curriculum issues so that when they graduate, they're able to step into the workforce and work if they choose not to go into the military or into higher education. Education will fix so many of our issues and the problems that we see across the state and across the nation, um, whether it's taxes, how to get a job, how to fill out a job application, how to be kind and respectful to all people. Uh, basically, it's the golden rule that we should be teaching in schools um, besides reading, math, science, history. We need to teach kindness and respect of all people too, rather than things like the critical race theory or sex education standards. Those have no, no purpose in the school. Um, no unfunded mandates being pushed down to the schools because it's ridiculous. We walk away from what we need to be teaching our children in order for them to have success in life. When I worked in the prison system, I saw so many illiterate adults and I was embarrassed and ashamed as an educator that we allowed so many people to fall through the cracks. Um, that's ridiculous. It should never happen. Whether it was uh, pushed by the no child left behind, bless you, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I tried not to sneeze on these interviews, but I just couldn't avoid that one. It's okay. Whether it's no child left behind, pushing them through, and it's really a disservice to our children and to the state. Um, other issues, I think that we need to lift restrictions on agriculture. Right now, there's there are so many restrictions 
on growing different crops and we need to lift those to allow our farmers to grow whatever they need to grow for success. So we can have, you know, not only national trade, but international trade. I would like to see the restrictions on hemp lifted so that we can bring in processing and manufacturing to the state and process the entire plant. You can use the fibrous roots of hemp for biofuels. We took a chance on corn to make biofuels, ethanol in Nebraska. I think we should also take the chance on hemp to use that as a biofuel as well, especially with the soaring prices of fuel across the nation. We need to do everything we can to correct that. And that's a green, renewable, sustainable form of energy. But also, if you use the entire plant, you can use that for agricultural um, bedding purposes. You can make building products with it, textiles, fabrics, um, everything. Concrete, there's something called hempcrete. Those things don't go away. It's, it lasts. It's a very strong product, stronger than steel. So we can have our own self-sustaining state with agriculture, with food, um, beef, pork, chicken, other poultry, turkey, whatever it is, but also make our own products for clothing and really do brand Nebraska. I don't care if you put a meadowlark on there or goldenrod or the cottonwood tree or, you know, the, the white-tailed deer uh, representing Nebraska, but we can market ourselves and bring a lot of money into the state, but we also bring in jobs. We want our kids to stay here. We need to give them something to do. More farming, more manufacturing, more development. Uh, we need technology in place so that we can compete on a global level. I think all of those things are important. Um, I, think, I think those are my main priorities. Oh, with the exception of mental health. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for our children up to age 24. That's a problem. And overall, suicide is above the national average in Nebraska. We need to address mental health more fiercely because we have soldiers coming back, especially with the COVID. We've seen so much depression, sadness, issues with mental health. Um, suicidal ideation. We need to take care of what we have right now and take the stigma off of getting help for mental health issues. Um, when our soldiers come back, let's give them maybe tiny houses, their decompression areas where they can slowly come back into society, get their mind wrapped around the change from being a soldier and a warrior to coming back and being a father or a mother in a non-combative society. I think we owe that to our soldiers. The other thing is I believe that we should legalize medical marijuana. There are people out there that I've talked to across the state, they're hurting. They, I mean, actual physical illness and disease. Um, I met a woman with MODS, major organ dysfunction syndrome. She has, she has a, a machine in her back, a spinal stimulator to help control the pain. When we know that medical marijuana, the full spectrum THC product will alleviate that pain. She doesn't want to be on opioids. They are addictive and they can cause overdose. They'll kill you. So we need to provide people with mods, people with epilepsy, cancer, whatever the disease that they have, autism, we need to be able to give them relief that's not an opioid that causes addiction and overdose. Uh, the product that they need to be provided needs to be a pure product without meth, without fentanyl, without cocaine or heroin laced into it to make it addictive because marijuana is not addictive. It has never ever killed anyone. Alcohol kills people. The opioids kill people. The meth that's going on right now across the state kills people. The fentanyl coming in is killing people. And they're trying to get pain relief. So let's allow medical marijuana to come in to serve 
people who really truly need it. My uncle went to Vietnam. He was exposed to Agent Orange and has Parkinson's so bad. If he used the full spectrum THC product from medical marijuana, those tremors would go away. He would be able to drive, be able to function. I have family with lupus and arthritis and uh, fibromyalgia. Medical marijuana provides relief for that too. So I think we need to consider that. That also brings in more jobs for people. It would have to be grown in a greenhouse, very controlled situation because of the potency, but that allows opportunity for more jobs, more manufacturing, more um, entrepreneurs with dispensaries out there, and they'd be very secure and provided for. Plus we can tax that if you want to have something that lowers our taxes in the state or um, changes, changes from personal property tax to taxation from a product that covers education, this will help do it. So it alleviates the problem for so many people with taxes, um, pain, other issues, depression, anxiety, PTSD, people trying to sleep, it's very important to use. All right, well, I think Leela, that's it. We are the, the, lucky that it's it. We're out of time. So, oh, excellent. Uh, thank, thank you very much uh, for spending this time with us, answering our questions. Um, we appreciate it. Like I said, we will uh, be posting this video. Um, and after we interview everyone uh, that's participating, we will make our endorsements. But again, Appreciate you taking the time to talk and we Absolutely. appreciate you taking the time to run for office. So thank you very yes. much, Leila. Thank you. All right, have a great, have a great day. day.